Good morning, everyone. It's exciting to be part of our partial return to getting to meet face to face. Uh, and good morning also to those who are tuning in from home. Uh, it's funny, I've been thinking a lot over the last few weeks and I've had a lot of conversations come up with people about people finding their purpose. I think there's been a lot of inward looking while we're all stuck at home. And so I've been having all these conversations about what we made for, what's on your heart, what do you intend to do? And then I find out that I'm service leading for Jeremiah 31. Uh, just a lovely little God coincidence that happens in your life there. So today we're going to hear from Andrew Sheed on those passages. Uh, my husband's going to pray, my father's going to do the Bible reading, and I have a question all teed up for Andrew, which actually comes from my sister-in-law, so it's quite the familial affair. But really excited to be looking forward to meeting with some of you physically at church tomorrow, uh, but also happy to be here with everyone who's meeting electronically. Now we're going to throw to my father for the Bible reading. So today's readings are two readings from Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 4 to 11, chapter 31, verse 27 to 34. Uh, these are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard, terror not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? And why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labour, every face turned deathly pale? How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. In that day, declares the Lord, I will break the yoke off their neck and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security and no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the king, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah with the offspring of people and of animals, just as I watch them over them to uproot and tear down and to overthrow, destroy and bring disaster. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say the parents have eaten grapes, sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. 
So uh, at our church for a while, we've had a tradition of doing questions after the sermon, but now that we're meeting physically again, uh, we aren't recording live. And so instead we have a question from last week. I believe that Michael is putting the number up for questions at the bottom of the screen. So if anything comes up during the sermon, you can text us a question for next week. So Andrew's question from last week, from my sister-in-law, uh, which I, I will put the caveat that she said, this is too big for question time, but Andrew wants to have a stab at it, is uh, you made a comment that Jeremiah touches on every book of the Bible. And mm -hmm. so she just wanted you to expand a little more on that. Sure, sure. Uh, without actually going through all the 66 books one by one and then all the New Testament 27. Um, I guess what I mean is that Jeremiah quotes or alludes to just about all the books that came before him in the Bible and gets quoted and used by the books after him. So maybe just a couple of quick examples. The book of Deuteronomy, um, Jeremiah's preaching was basically a series of sermons on the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so in Jeremiah 11, he preaches a sermon on Deuteronomy 27, preaches another sermon on Deuteronomy 29. Um, there's a single verse in Deuteronomy 29, which basically runs through the whole book. So everywhere you've got Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. um, another example is the prophets from the century before him, Hosea, Micah, Amos. Um, he uses them all the time. Mm -hmm. There's actually in Jeremiah 26, a quote from Micah 3.12, which mm -hmm. is the only time a Bible book quotes another Bible book by name in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And then after Jeremiah, when they came back from exile, uh, the prophets were incredibly influenced, especially by Jeremiah's prophecy that the exile would last for 70 years. Mm -hmm. So you've got Daniel praying and reflecting on the 70 years being up. You've got um, the book of Chronicles reflecting on Jeremiah's prophecy at the end. You've got um, e Nehemiah reforming Judaism, quoting Jeremiah's use of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you get to the New Testament, uh, Jeremiah isn't quoted as often as the Psalms or Isaiah or Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. but he's sort of there in the background. Paul, um, I think, thought of himself Jeremiah-like mm -hmm. as the uh, apostle to the nations. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of Jeremiah flavor in 2 Corinthians. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, which quotes Jeremiah chapter 30. Mm -hmm. um, in 31, uh, with the slaughter of the infants and Rachel's voice weeping in Rama. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as we're going to see in today's sermon, uh, Jesus uh, inaugurates the new covenant, mm -hmm. which is our passage today. So um, I need to stop there, but I could keep going all day. Yep. Okay, well, thank you for that. Now, thanks for the question. Well, hi everyone. It's great to be back for round two out of three on Jeremiah. Uh, last week we looked at Jeremiah's message of judgment, uh, but thankfully judgment is not the last word. And today we turn to the topic of forgiveness. Now I'm not going to try and cover another 15 chapters. Uh, you'll be very happy to know. Uh, today our focus is just going to be half a verse. Uh, there it is. For I will forgive their wickedness and their sins I will remember no more. Now the book of Jeremiah begins when God puts words of power into the prophet's mouth. Chapter 1 verse 9, The Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I've put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And see that image there of the Word of God as an irresistible, unstoppable force. But by the book's halfway point, we reach this terrible crisis. Jeremiah chapter 25. This is Jeremiah speaking. He says, From the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, 23 years, the Word of the Lord has come to me, and I've spoken to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed. The Lord sent all his servants, the prophets, to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. 
You see the crisis there. The word of God may be an irresistible force, but the people's deafness makes them an immovable object. So what happens when an irresistible force hits an immovable object? Well, it's basically a giant explosion, right? Instead of reaching in to transform a repentant people, the word of God has reached out in terrible power and brought Babylon's armies crashing down on his beloved people. As we saw last week, the word uh, of God uh, was met by the people with absolute rejection. They turned away so often that they basically lost the ability to repent. And they had no remorse left, no trust, no sincerity, no truthfulness. They had made themselves impossible to forgive. Now there will be some of you listening to this who have experienced relationships in which forgiveness stops working. I know of a teenaged son who used to steal from his parents in order to pay for a, a drunken, abusive lifestyle. Um, the police would be involved, the child would weep and repent, the parents would forgive him, and he'd just steal again. And, you know, eventually the words, I forgive you, lose, they become meaningless. They lose their power to restore a relationship. That makes today's verse a real problem. If God's people have put themselves beyond the point where they can be forgiven, how can God promise to forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more? Right, those words, wickedness and sins, they are the exact words that God used when he said he would remember their wickedness. Back in Jeremiah 14, we looked at this verse last week. This is what the Lord says about this people. They greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. So what's changed? What's changed that God can now say he will forgive their wickedness and not remember their sins? Well, on one level, the answer to that, I guess, is not too hard. It's not like God has changed his mind about judging them. No, what's changed is that after they've been judged, God promises to make a new covenant with them in which he'll forgive them. But if we look more closely at our little verse in its context, it's not that simple. Now, God's actually promising to do something a whole lot harder than simply forgive them, just like he's done time and time again in the past. Right, the forgiveness that God offers now in the new covenant is going to be something completely new. Now, I want us to wrestle with this text together until we see what that new thing is. So would you just pause and pray with me uh, before we continue? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your powerful, irresistible word. And we pray that as we read it and think about it today, you would give us understanding by your spirit that we might know you and love you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, as we come into the famous New Covenant prophecy, Jeremiah actually prepares for this announcement with a set of six songs. Uh, they're songs of hope. They start at the beginning of Jeremiah 30 and go all the way through to chapter 31, verse 23. Uh, they're songs of hope, but they're not straightforward because they're filled with the pain caused by Israel's unfaithfulness. Now, we heard the first song in our Bible reading. And I want to take you back to its ending, chapter 30, verse 10. So do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, and do not be dismayed, Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you appropriately. I will certainly not leave you unpunished. Now, what just happened? You know, just when you thought the poem was happily ended, the last word isn't peace, but it's like vigorous punishment. 
When's that going to happen? Is God saying that he's going to punish now? Or is it after they've been saved? It doesn't say. You know, there, it, it's like there are no simple solutions left. Sure, God could forgive. He could say, I forgive you, I'm going to save you, I'm going to restore you. But what's going to happen next? You know, what's he going to do when they turn against him yet again? Is he just going to forgive one more time and repeat the cycle? Sure, God can save, but forgiveness is no longer going to be enough. Something new and impossible is going to have to happen if anything is going to change going into the future. And the beginning of the song actually gave us an image of something impossible. Go back to verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see. Can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor, every face turned deathly pale? How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, yet he will be saved out of it. The new forgiveness that God promises is going to be as impossible as a man giving birth. And the five songs that follow, which unfortunately we don't really have time to read or look at today, but you can go back and look at them in your own time, those five songs um, develop this theme of impossible hope. Right? Impossible hope. And the final verse, uh, I just want to read because it brings up another image of male-female reversal. Chapter 31, verse 22. How long will you turn this way and that, O daughter of turning? For the Lord has created a new thing on the earth. A female will encompass a man. Well, that verse needs probably a whole sermon, but daughter of turning basically means a person who turns away from God because it's in their nature. It's like it's written into their DNA. But this verse says God is going to do something new. So, what on earth does a female will encompass a man? What does that mean? Uh, if you want, you've got the phone number, you can ask me for the next question time, but I can tell you right now, I don't know. Honestly, the scholars cannot make their minds up. And actually, I think that last line is meant to be a mystery. It's basically telling us that God has a plan to fix human turning, human faithlessness, by this huge, mysterious, impossible reversal of his whole created order. Well, how's he going to do that? What's he going to do? The answer is as mysterious as the ending of those songs. Well, this finally brings us to the famous new covenant promise. Now, the word new is significant because the only other time that Jeremiah uses the word new, believe it or not, is in the verse we just read about the female and the man. Right? And that suggests that the new covenant is going to be as new and impossible as this huge, impossible overturning of nature that the songs have just been singing about. So here it is, Jeremiah 31, 33. Uh, to help you see the structure of it, I've put some numbers into the text. Um, let's read it. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. First, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. Secondly, I will be their God and they will be my people. And thirdly, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Uh, in other words, the new covenant contains three linked promises. The background for the first promise is back in chapter 17, verse 1. I haven't got the verse up for you, but chapter 17, verse 1, uh, Jeremiah says, sin is engraved on the tablet of their hearts. Right? In today's language, I guess we'd say that sin is hardwired into us. But in the new covenant, God is going to rewire us. Right? He's going to write over that sinful writing with his own words his own law. Now the heart in the Old Testament doesn't mean, you know, romance. Uh, it means the will. It represents the choices that you make. So once God's word starts reshaping the people's will, that's going to enable step two, which is a relationship. Right? I will be their God, they shall be my people, is actually marriage language 
back in Jeremiah's day. It's saying that Israel is going to become God's bride. She's going to remain faithful to him. Why? Because his word will be written on her heart. It'll shape her choices and make her faithful. So then the final result of this step three is that every single member of God's people will know him. Every single person. But we're not going to live just because some priest intercedes for us. We each live by our own righteousness, and it's a righteousness that comes by God's gift, the gift of a new heart, right? an inner transformation that is nothing less than an impossible, mysterious new work of creation. It's an amazing promise, isn't it? But its climax is perhaps even more amazing. There it is down the bottom in bold, our verse for today. It begins with a because and that because explains all those three previous statements. It is because of the forgiveness described here that the people are going to be recreated on the inside. Or to put that the other way around, forgiveness is the reason why God will write on their heart. That is completely unexpected. It's really hard to get your head around, actually. Uh, and I'm going to say it a third time. So just give you another chance to get your head around this. So you're listening. The inner transformation which the law of Moses failed to achieve, which 23 years of Jeremiah's preaching didn't manage to achieve, that transformation is now going to be achieved by divine forgiveness. Right? God is not going to forgive them because they've become godly and they deserve it. They're going to be actually made godly by God's act of forgiveness. Now, I want to praise God for that, but I, I've got a problem with it as well. Because basically, forgiveness just doesn't do that. Right? In particular, the forgiveness the law describes in the Old Testament, it doesn't precede repentance, and it doesn't produce repentance. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, forgiveness doesn't precede repentance because if, to forgive a person before they've stopped sinning just doesn't make sense, right? It's only, think of King David, it's only after King David confessed his adultery with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah, that God forgave him. Repentance has to come first. Now, of course, uh, you or I can forgive someone in our heart even if they haven't repented. I'm not denying that for a moment. But that's not going to restore the relationship, is it? And that's not how the Old Testament law works either. So forgiveness doesn't precede repentance. And secondly, the idea that forgiveness can somehow produce repentance, I think, is even more difficult. Um, you know, there are books about the power of forgiveness, but there are always books about how if you forgive somebody, it's really powerful for healing you. Um, there is nowhere else in the Old Testament where forgiveness makes the forgiven person start suddenly to be good. Right? It's actually the opposite. Whenever God forgave Israel before this, before this, their reaction was always the same. It was like, excellent, we got away with it, we can do it again. Right? It, as Jeremiah says, the heart is crooked above all things. It is incurable. Forgiveness never produced repentance, ever, in Israel's history. So, I want to come back one last time to today's little memory verse. They shall all know me because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Do you notice what God promises to forgive exactly? Wickedness. Now, some Bibles call this iniquity. It's actually like a little technical word, and that is not normal either, to forgive wickedness. That word specifically describes evil behavior that is outside the power of the law to forgive. Right? And that the only times in Israel's history when God has forgiven wickedness have been like extraordinary times, times when God extended a forgiveness on appeal that had nothing to do with the law. A forgiveness that he just purely offered out of his divine goodness. And the first time in the Bible we see this forgiveness discussed is in that famous episode of the golden calf in Exodus 34, 
when God takes Moses up onto the mountain and he reveals himself to Moses. Verse 6, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Now Moses' response was to pray with amazing boldness. Down in verse 9 of the same chapter, Moses says, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, may the Lord go with us. Though this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our iniquity and our sin, or our wickedness and our sin, and make us your inheritance. It takes a great prophet to come before God and intercede for him to do what the law cannot do and forgive simply out of the goodness of his own nature. And in Israel's later history, we'll find just a few times when another great prophet rides up, rises up, intercedes to God to forgive wickedness, uh, just not because of the law, but because of God's name or God's steadfast love. But by the time Jeremiah comes along, Israel is so far gone that it's too late even for a prophet to make a difference. Remember Jeremiah 14. The Lord will remember their wickedness and punish their sins. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for the welfare of this people. A few verses later in Jeremiah, God tells him, Even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to this people. Right? Judah has been cut off even from God's extraordinary forgiveness. The reason... Well, their long pattern of sinning, being forgiven, sinning, being forgiven, sinning, just, it could not be allowed to go on. Right? Forgiveness through all their history has done nothing to fix the problem of hearts with sin written all over them. Okay. We've spent quite a lot of time wrestling with this puzzle. And the reason I've taken you through this is because I want you to see just how new and impossible the new covenant is. Now, when God promises to forgive their wickedness and remember their sin no more, he is reaching into his own character as the gracious Lord who forgives wickedness and sin. But instead of offering that extraordinary forgiveness just on a few rare and special occasions, in the new covenant, God is now making this like an ordinary, everyday aspect of his relationship with us. And somehow, when God shares himself with us, when God makes himself present to us as a God abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, that, that act of giving himself, that has the power, for the first time in history, to transform the forgiven person on the inside. That is infinitely mysterious, infinitely powerful. New covenant forgiveness. What is it? It is where God gives himself to us and changes us forever. Well, I've made you think about half a verse for long enough. Uh, it's time to think about where all this is heading. So what have we seen? According to Jeremiah 30... From all of those songs through into the New Covenant, forgiveness is not enough. doesn't fix the real problem. But the New Covenant offers a new type of forgiveness. Right? A forgiveness that just doesn't declare that we're right with God. It actually makes us right with God. This forgiveness recreates us on the inside so that our heart is fixed in a new position, our will faces towards God and not away from him. It doesn't make us sinless, but it makes us want to be. Well, how does God manage to do that? He does it by making himself present to us, present in us, as the Lord abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's a mystery. But, you know, it's much less mysterious for us than it was for Jeremiah. Jesus' obedience to the point of death on a cross, that shows us what it looks like for God to give himself to us. 
But then Jeremiah teaches us that the gift of Christ's death, that gift releases a forgiveness whose power is like a whole new creation. Now, when you think about Christ's gift, that mysterious, impossible new forgiveness that God promised, it makes sense at last, right? Remember what Jesus said at the Last Supper? This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. You know, I really love the way Jesus was preparing his disciples to grasp this power of new covenant forgiveness from the very beginning of his ministry, but in his miracles of healing. You remember his words when he raises the paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2? There it is for you to read. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your stretcher, and walk? but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, I tell you, rise, pick up your stretcher, and go home. That was basically a miracle of resurrection power. And Jesus wanted his disciples to see that as a sign of the forgiveness that his death would release. And after Jesus' resurrection, the disciples experienced that self-giving of Jesus personally. Right? On the day of Pentecost, Jesus made himself present in each believer by his spirit, just like he does for us, in a self-giving that literally makes each of us into a new creation. Praise God. Now, there are plenty of applications we could make from this. So much to think about, and I encourage you to do that uh, with one another during the week. But uh, for now, as we come to a close, I've just got one. One application. Very simple. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful that God has not held you to the standards of the law. But he's reached out to you in an act of such extraordinary forgiveness, at such cost to himself, that you're changed forever. We live in hard times in 2020. There's no certainty about what the next year holds. Many people have lost jobs. Some have lost loved ones. All of us have lost the old pattern of our lives. But one thing that can never be taken away from us is the power and permanence of God's new forgiveness. So let me encourage you, Brothers and sisters, lift your eyes above all of this turmoil and be thankful. The tougher things get, the more crucial it is to practice that discipline of thankfulness. Remember Paul's words, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Old things have passed away and look, new things have come. Basically, he's saying the same thing as Jeremiah when he says, I will forgive their wickedness and their sins I will remember no more. So I want to really encourage you not to let a single day go past when you don't make time to stop, remember, and be thankful. Shall we pray? I'm going to pray with some of Jeremiah's words. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. But heal us, Lord, and we will be healed. Save us, and we will be saved. For you are the one we praise. Amen. Well, we're going to start practicing thankfulness right away in the words of our first song, Jesus, thank you. of Calvary. 
Heavenly Father, as Melbourne goes into lockdown and restrictions go into place for Victorians, we pray that people act out of love to protect those around them. In a day and age where every decision appears to backfire, we pray for wisdom and courage from the government. Lord, this world is truly broken. Let a little light shine in our lives. Let those suffering from mental illness will take comfort in your love. Even in this climate of anxiety and despair, we pray that people learn to be loving to their community and to those who are vulnerable. Lord, as we see a widespread transmission in places across the world where COVID-19 wasn't taken seriously, 
We pray for those in power to have loving wisdom and the courage to make the hard decisions. It's easy to let things slip in this time. Continue to sanctify us. Let us become better individuals, a better community, and a better church. In the same way, let us remember that this is a marathon, not a sprint. The goal is not to be the fastest or the best. The goal is to finish the race, having kept the faith. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, whether it was in person at church or whether it was from home. It's really great to be meeting together as a church family again. Thank you. Yeah.